there, I'm going to go ahead and invite you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Today we're starting Philippians chapter 2 after several weeks in. And uh, uh, a couple things that I will say, disclaimer if you will, as we step into Philippians chapter 2. First, oh yes, there are sermon notes. Uh, one, you can get these online. These are at our, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can go straight there to the events and find it. Uh, if you are not, if, if you, you prefer not to use QR codes, then right underneath it is a, you can type that into your web browser, bit.ly backslash defiant joy four. And that will take you right to the notes so that you can follow along with me. I would encourage you also to, you can save the notes. Uh, if, if you tried to go back, if, uh, if you noticed last Sunday, you were going back and you tried to go and look for the notes after the service, they kind of disappear from the events page. But if you save it, they will be on your, um, in your app there for you to follow along afterwards. Again, this is uh, starting in chapter two. Um, This chapter is going to take take a change. And I'm glad that I didn't preach this message before we officially moved here, because now that we're here and in the house, you can't get rid of us. Um, Now, um, I'm as I said from week one, um, I, I believe that it's important for me to preach from the Bible. Uh, my opinion won't change a whole lot. It, it is the word of God that brings change in people's lives. But how many of you know also that does not always make us feel all warm and fuzzy inside, but sometimes it, it involves bringing um, correction or conviction by the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and, and I, I am very much a straightforward, just kind of shoot straight kind of preacher. And so today I'm going to do just that, and I'm going to ask you again to remember that you love me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but we're going to step into this today, and before because I, I believe that as we step into chapter two, that God is really going to. I think He's going to speak to a lot of us today on some different issues. But let me give you just a recap. Started Philippians. We call this defiant joy because Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi. The book is full. You read it over 16 to 20 times, four chapters, not a long book, but you see, read at least 20 times where he re, or he talks about joy. And you can see in his writing that he, that he is full of joy, but it doesn't really make sense. Why? Because he's writing this from prison. He's chained to a guard 24 hours a day. He is, he will be in, in, in this, he'll be in prison for at least two years. At, at the end of his prison sentence, after a little bit of time, uh, he will, his, he will, he will be, he will be executed because of his faith. Knowing all this and knowing what, what he is facing, he still is able to write in such a way to help you and to help me understand what joy is and where it comes from. We, we sometimes mix up joy and happiness, right? Because they, they, they both sound kind of similar or give us the same feeling. But we've said the last couple of weeks, happiness, it's a temporary feeling. When things are going good, we feel happy, right? When things are, well, happiness is just that, is that peace, it's that feeling good because things are going good. But joy is something deeper. Joy is not found or based simply in the temporary feelings. Joy is based, it's, it's rooted in something deeper for you and for me as followers of Jesus. It's rooted in the fact that Jesus gave his life for us. That even, even though my day n- might not be going well, I am promised that both now and forever that he is with me. That's a good thing, isn't it? Like that, like for, for me, things can be going bad, but knowing that Jesus is with me should be something that gives me, it gives life meaning even when things outside aren't going well. And so the first chapter, Paul really focuses on this idea. Listen, if for you to have joy, you can't just be so focused on what's happening to you. You can't be focused on your situation, on your circumstances. If it's about that focus, if, it's, if you're only focused on what's in front of you, then a lot of times we're not going to have, we're not, we're not going to feel joy. 
Paul was able to be filled with joy because he knew he had made a decision early on in his life as a follower of Jesus that I'm going to dedicate my life to following Jesus. Everything I go through, I'm going to use as an opportunity to point people to Jesus. Again, his secret in the first chapter is that singular focused mind. But chapter two changes things up a little bit. Because I think chapter one focused really on the things that happened to us. But chapter two really begins to focus on other people. How many of you know people can cause us to lose our happiness? Anybody? I mean, people can cause us to lose our joy at times. And Paul gets, re- gets up in our business in chapter two in a way that a lot of us are going to feel uncomfortable about because he uses a word and an idea that we just don't like. Chapter two, he says the secret to joy, your mindset, it's a submissive mindset. Submission. How many love that word submit? Anybody? Uh, Right. None of us do. Uh, It depends. Sometimes submission is not something we like to talk about or think about. It's not something that, that we enjoy. But I think Paul wants us to understand today how important this idea is in light, even in the face of what our culture And what those around us believe. So Philippians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning as we read our primary text today. As we've said, I've said, uh, as we stand, it's not a religious act for us. It's a way to demonstrate reverence for God's word. We don't do it through every passage that we read, but we're going to do it through our primary text. and say, God, we are trusting you today to speak to us. Starting in verse 1. Paul writes, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. And therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. God, we, we, we believe that your word is alive and active, God, that the truths contained here are not just truths for thousands of years ago, but they're guidance and direction for us today. So speak to us. May our hearts, may our, may our minds, may our ears be open, not only, God, today to hear, but to act upon what you speak to us. We love you and we trust you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. Philippians chapter 2. How many sports fans in the room? Anybody? Any sports fans? Two of us? All right, good. Three. All right. So sport, So I, I enjoy sports. Uh, I'm looking forward to football season coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, I like going uh, on Sunday afternoons after church just putting a game on, um, e- even if I don't know who's playing uh, or even if I don't like who's playing. I, I remember uh, last last season, there was one Sunday I came home and, and, uh, and there was a football, there was a game on. It was the Jets versus the Steelers. Some of you might be thinking, that's a great game. I could have cared less. I didn't care about the teams. I don't care who was playing. For me, it was just an opportunity to watch. Because listen, watching teams play when they move in motion together, it is something to behold. It is incredible to see when, th- when people move together uh, in this. But uh, 
when I look at this, I, I don't, here's the truth, I really don't understand football that well. I don't know all the rules. Um, I don't understand all the schemes, whether you're playing a dime package on defense or a nickel, or if you're playing a quarter, or if you're playing a half dollar. I don't know what you're playing. I just, and, and, you know, I, I, I watch and I enjoy and I, and I see, I know the goal is to get the ball from here to there. I get that part of it and we cheer when they do that and, and I love that. But I don't fully understand all of the rules. And, and, and it's, and I, I've watched and I've played the games like that Madden, you know, if you've got, if you're a teenager or if you've got, te- or if you're an adult too. Uh, I've played that, um, but when I play against somebody who really knows what they're doing, I, I get whooped every single time. Because they're like, oh yeah, watch this play, watch this motion. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm just hitting A and B and hoping somebody catches it or when they throw it. Okay, that's really what I'm looking at there. But for those who understand and they're watching as people line up, they're watching all the things, they love it. But I love to watch the teams move together. And, and here's the thing. Um, there are great indiv- individual players, and, and we all want the best players on our team. But at the end of the day, you could have the best quarterback in the NFL. But if his offensive line can't protect him, if his wide receivers can't catch the ball, if the running backs can't gain any ground on running plays, it doesn't matter how good that quarterback is. They're just not going to win. Uh, it's a, I see, I understand a couple things. Some of you are like, oh, Jesus, help us. I played, I played real football growing up, the one who played with your feet. Uh, so that's I understand that one. I understand soccer really well. I played that one. So that one's a lot easier for me. But I, I'm learning. I'm learning. 53 players on an active roster of a football team. A lot of guys. But how many of you think or believe that they all get along all the time? Probably not. But there's something that happens when they get on the field. They can put aside their differences for the good of the team. I also like basketball. Basketball is another, another sport that I enjoy. I remember a couple years ago, I remember reading the headlines as the Golden State Warriors. They're, they're a, a great team. But I remember reading the headlines when two of the players, Draymond Green, uh, got, and he and Jordan Poole got into a fight in practice. And Draymond threw a punch, knocked him out, and it, it caused this riff on the team. And it was crazy to think about because just a few months before that fight, Those two guys were on the team together and won a national championship. So it's no wonder to me that a team, that players, the individuals that are getting paid millions of dollars to play a sport together, they don't always get along. So guess what? It doesn't doesn't surprise me when in the church, we don't always get along. Because we're not even getting paid for it, are we? <laughs> Some of y'all are like, y'all should be paying me to show it. No, but, but, that's, but isn't it interesting how in this, how even play, players, the individuals who have different perspectives on things can put aside their differences for the common good. And we get into this chapter here, and Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. As you you read through kind of some of the history around this, we know that one of his mentees, if you will, uh, Epaphroditus. How many of you are glad your name's not Epaphroditus? Anybody else? Uh, I just call me E, you know? (laughs) E came and brought him, brought, brought Paul, probably brought him some, some, uh, some help. He brought him some provisions because if you were in prison, it wasn't like prison here where, where you get three meals a day and you get a place, you know, there, if you didn't, if somebody did not provide food or water for you, you didn't eat. And so Paul was, he was brought some provision, but he was also brought some news about the church in Philippi. And in the church, there was some fighting going on. There were some people who, 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 who didn't get along on some things. And we don't know what the arguments were. We don't know if they were arguing over the color of the carpet. We don't know if they were arguing if the pastor talks too long or if it's too short, we need to be there longer. We don't know what the issue was. We just know that there was some arguments. And Paul doesn't just say, oh, well, it'll be okay. Paul speaks right to the issue. 
he goes right into it and says, hey, 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 we, we need to talk about this. And I think sometimes the, the, the downfall for a lot of it was we don't, we don't talk. We just kind of let things sit. And I think Paul's words would speak directly to you and to me today. He says in this, he goes, look, Paul begins to unpack and says, for joy to be yours, not just a feeling of happiness in the moment, but joy that will carry you through difficult situations and circumstances. It's going to take you being focused on Jesus, but it's also going to take you being willing to submit to others. There's that word again. Submit. I did put in the notes and therefore it, what, what they say here, a couple different definitions of this word submit first is to accept or yield to a superior force or to the authority or will of another person. And we see in scripture kind of submission is putting others before ourselves. It means not always doing what I want. It's putting God's desires above other desires. But again, this isn't Parker talking. We're going back to what? To Scripture, what God would say to us. And so we look at this, and there's a couple of, if you look at verse 1 again, Paul asks a couple of rhetorical questions. He says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Well, let me ask you, is there any encouragement today from belonging to Christ? Okay, okay, good. So I I think we're in agreement there. He goes on, any comfort from his love? Anybody feel comfort from the love of Jesus? Okay, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? He asked those questions, but Paul wasn't expecting them to answer every question. He was basically saying, look, if that is the case, then... Verse 2, he says, make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Paul says, hey, if those things are true, then I need you to shift your focus. And, And I can imagine him thinking, look, for you to have this joy that fills my heart, your focus has to be taken off the things you're facing and, and put and, and put your focus on Jesus. And then once you do that, you got to take your focus off of you and put it on others. Paul is extending this personal request that he knows if they'll take hold of it, it will change everything. He says agreeing wholeheartedly, loving one another, working together. I love the way it said that Eugene Peterson wrote it in the message, starting in verse 1, you'll see it on the screen, or it says, hey, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart... I mean, he's like just straight at it, isn't he? If you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other, love each other, and be deep-spirited friends. He goes on. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. I think Paul is saying here, Very. I think he would basically say this, look, if Jesus has made a difference at all in your life, then do me a favor and stop acting like little kids. See, we might not say it out loud, but we really don't like this idea of submission in the, in the good old USA, do we? In the US, we love talking about our rights. And yeah, I'd like to see somebody try and take this from me or take that from me. Come and get it, right? We live in a society that prioritizes who? Me! It's about me! Yeah, mom and dad provide for their kids, but the jobs that we have, the opportunities that we seek, the things we want and that we get, if we're brutally honest, it's getting ahead for our own sake. That's the American way. That's what we're going for. 
right? We, we go 90 miles an hour all day, all week, all year, so we can get ahead, so we can be more comfortable, so we can have things, so we can enjoy the rights and the privileges of being Americans. And, and don't get me wrong, I love our country. I'm grateful to be a citizen of this country. I'm grateful for the things I have. I'm grateful for the rights that I have. But somewhere along the way, the church has fallen into this same idea, this same mindset, the same focus, and we start fighting amongst ourselves over who is right, what political side is wrong, and all of a sudden, we start fighting in the church in such a way that the differences between those who claim to be followers of Jesus and those who are not, are not very different, are they? We may be older and have more expensive toys, but unfortunately, we're still like the little kids in the sandbox fighting over who gets to play with the dump truck. It's mine. I had it first. I'm going to tell my mommy. And Paul starts to lay out how foolish that is. And that if you want to have joy and walk in true joy, it never comes from that. You might be happy in the moment, but when you've pushed everybody and everything else away, you're lonely, tired, and you're living completely against the way that we have been wired to live, and that is in community with people. See, we're created for relationship, but if we only care about us, if we're only looking out for me, then we miss it. Isn't it interesting that among other things, when Lucifer and the angels who had become his legion of demons, when, when they were cast out of heaven, it stemmed from his desire to have his way and to receive glory instead of God. The separation between heaven and in hell stemmed from an angel's desire to put self first. So Paul goes on in verse three, he says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests. Take an interest in others too. Paul knew that for the church to fulfill the mission that God had given them, that they had to walk together, they had to walk united, there had to be unity in the body, and that's not always easy. We don't know what the church was arguing about, but we see what Paul's laying out for them. He says, hey, if you're going to do what God has called you to do, if you're going to be the people that God has called you to be, your motives cannot be personal gain or ambition. That's not going to help you fulfill it. Paul goes on, he says, be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. In other translations, it says, in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than yourself. This was completely countercultural in ancient Greek and Roman thought. They viewed this attitude as a fault, as weak. Their idea of manhood was to be assertive, to impose your will on others. Nobody makes me do anything. Don't tread on me. Try and take it from me, I dare you. But Paul was saying, yes, yeah, followers of Jesus, as the church, that attitude has to go out the window. Paul says, don't just look out for yourself. He says, look out for others. Again, our current cultural mindset is take care of me, get mine. That's the priority. And Paul says, yeah, that has to change. And this doesn't sit well, does it? I mean, I, I see it in me. I see all these things in, at different times. And I personally don't like the idea of having to submit my will, my desires, my ideas to anybody else. And why should I? Why, why should we? 
Why should we work towards unity? What does it matter in the grand scheme of things? And Paul has a one word answer. He says, why? He says, Jesus. It all goes back to Jesus. Paul wrote that this is the way the world lives and acts and breathes. But Jesus laid out a different way for us. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus. Look, it's not fire insurance. It's not a get out of hell car when life is over. It's not a prayer when you're 15 to ensure that one day, whenever that day comes, that you get into heaven. It's about how we live right now and up to the moment that we do stand before Jesus. What we do right now, how we live in this life, in this time, it matters. I think the story of Jesus, when he, when he called Peter to follow him, do you remember that story? He goes and he's preaching and he gets into Peter's boat. Peter's been fishing all night long. And, and, and he said, and Jesus says, hey, push out. And Peter's probably tired and he's hungry. He's ready to go home. And Jesus says, hey, cast your net, nets out. And Jesus, and Paul's, I mean, sorry, Peter's looking at him like, who are you? You're not a fisherman. I've been out all night. But he makes an important statement. Then he goes, but because you say so, I will. And so he casts his nets out and he brings in more fish that day. He says it probably than he would have in the entire month, if not a six month time period. And then Jesus says to him, those famous words now, follow me. For him to follow Jesus, he had to leave everything behind. It wasn't Jesus, I'll follow you on the weekends, but I got this. It was, no, 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 completely, totally, 100% following Jesus. That's what it is to follow Jesus. It's, It's everything about us right now. It's the way that we live. It's the way that we talk. It's our attitude. It's everything. That's how it is to follow Jesus. And it's, and here's the thing. We say, well, what does that have to do with this passage? It has everything to do with this passage. Because after Paul makes this statement, after he says, hey, humble yourself, do this, then he goes in verse 5, look at verse 5, and he says very simply, he says, you must have the same attitude as Jesus. And what was Jesus' attitude? Well, he lays it out for us in the next three verses. He says, though he was God, he didn't think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Paul basically writes as, you think it's tough for you to submit to someone else? That submitting to others is difficult because of who you are or what you have? Let me point out somebody else who did it and had a little bit higher, harder time. Jesus. Jesus is God. He's part of the Trinity. His existence didn't begin in the manger. He is the eternal God. He had all the right and privileges of God, but he didn't hold on to it and say, no, 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 this is mine. You can't take it. He relinquished it. He laid it down. He laid down what was rightfully his. He emptied himself of his divine rights to come and serve as a lowly servant and took on the mortal form of a human being. The verse says he humbled himself. And I think we misunderstand this at times. It's not that the humble person thinks less of herself. She thinks of herself less. They submit to someone else, not just because that that person is higher or mightier, but because they recognize to follow in the way of Jesus means to attend to the needs of others first. So what does it mean that Jesus humbled himself? I think it's this. He humbled himself in that he took on the form of a man and not a more glorious creature like an angel. He came as a human being. He was born as a child. He didn't, he didn't arrive as a man. He didn't come and live in the king's palace. He was born into poverty to an oppressed people. 
That's who Jesus came to. He he submitted, even as a kid, to fallen people, to people who have made mistakes. He submitted as a child to his parents, to Mary and to Joseph. He humbled himself in that way. He, He was humble in the companions and the disciples that he chose. He didn't pick the best and the brightest, which gives me hope. I'm like, good, thank you, Jesus. He didn't pick the best. He picked others, he picked guys to follow him who most people would have passed over. He said, no, 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 he humbled himself in that way. He humbled himself in total obedience to his heavenly father in his submission to the Holy Spirit in choosing and submitting to death on the cross. And let's talk about that for a second. Crucifixion was the lowest form of death. It was the way somebody who was cursed would be put to death. Romans would not even allow Roman citizens to be, to be put to death by crucifixion because it was too shameful. And yet Jesus, who knew no sin, willingly submitted and humbled himself to death on a cross. An agonizing form of death. Shameful as people would walk by and would laugh at you, spit on you, make fun of you. And he did that. He endured that. And he went to it humbly and submitted to the Father. Why? Because of you and because of me. If anybody had reason, if any person or any being had reason to not go through, to not submit, it would be Jesus, the Son of God, the 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 eternal one. And yet he came and he lived in such a way so that you and I could see that what he was asking of could be done. I don't like the idea, the term submission. I don't like not getting my way. I think my way is good. I think my ideas are great. I think everybody should like my ideas. I think everybody should do what I think they should do. And I don't think I should have to listen to anybody. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of times all of us have that same attitude. We might not say it out loud. We might not use those words. And yet Paul says, he starts this chapter out saying, listen, I'm I'm telling you that to live fully, to be filled with joy, it starts by putting your focus firmly on Jesus. And second, by saying, not my will, not my way, but yours. I I know this isn't a fun message. (laughs) This isn't a shout you down, get all excited, let's all go and party after this, right? I know this flies in the face of everything that we know and everything our culture stands for. I know this isn't easy, but I also know that to be a follower of Jesus isn't selective, that I get to pick and choose the things I like and I spit the rest of it out. It means that my attitude has to be like that of Jesus. Well, in what areas? All of them. All of them. There, there's a song that we sung in church for a long time that the lyrics were written uh, by a man named Judson Van Deventer. Words were written about in, in the year around the year 1890. And published in 1896, but Van Deventer was an accomplished musician. He was an art teacher and a supervisor of art in local public schools where he lived. 
Uh, from what we know, he was a he was involved in his church, and he was he, he wanted and he was doing everything he could to follow Jesus. He had people in his life who who seemed to sense that God had called him to be an evangelist, to travel, and yet he had a good job, he had a good thing going, he had all this stuff, and he struggled that inner struggle of do I do I quit everything and, 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 and do this or not. And the story goes that in a, he was in a meeting in East Palestine, Ohio. For some time, he wrote, I struggled between developing my talents in the field of art and going into full-time evangelistic work. And at last, the pivotal hour of my life came and I surrendered all. A new day was ushered into my life. I became an evangelist and discovered down deep in my soul a talent that before this was unknown to me. God had hidden a song in my heart and touching a tender chord, he caused me to sing. That was when the song, that the hymn that we've sung for so many years was born, I Surrender All. We're told that one uh, one of the people who would hear this song that it really moved in their life, his name was William Borden or Bill Borden. Bill was the heir to the Borden fortune. He graduated high school, and after he graduated high school, he spent a year traveling the world, getting to see and experience different things, different cultures. And on July 2nd, 1905, He attended meetings in London uh, on the subject of assurance of salvation, and he was deeply moved. And after the sermon, a soloist sang, I surrender all. And with deep feeling, Bill stood with several others and sang the chorus, I surrender all. I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. He was 17 years old, but the die was cast He returned home, gave away a crazy amount of money, and left to go to the mission field. He heard a song that gripped his heart. He decided that when he sang it, it would be more than just words on a page, because they didn't have screens back then. But he said, no, 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 this is my desire oh to Jesus I surrender all to thee I freely care I will ever love and trust him in your presence daily. Would you stand with me this morning? I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Would you bow your heads to close your eyes right where you are for just a moment? The only way that you and I will fully experience the joy that Paul wrote about, that Paul lived out, all understood, is being willing to lay down, to submit our will, to submit our ways to the Father. God's called us, he's placed 
vision inside of us. As I said at the beginning of the day, this church is not dead. This church is alive. There is a mission for us to accomplish, but we can't accomplish it divided. We must be united to accomplish the vision that God has given us. In so doing, for you and I to do that, it's going to require unity, and it's going to require you and I to lay down our thoughts, lay down our hopes, and lay them down at the feet of Jesus. Just as, as Bill saying, as, 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 as Van Den Venter wrote, we must be willing to surrender all, to submit to others. How do we do it? In our own strength? Nope, not a chance. Based on what culture tells us, not going to happen. But based on the life and example of Jesus and through his grace, through his mercy, is possible. I imagine that as we listened, as you listened, that God more than likely was pointing out things in your life, things, attitudes, ideas that you've held on to and thought, my way is better. That I believe God would ask us to lay it down and not just for the good of others, but so that his joy may come to life in us. And I want us to take just a moment before we leave this place today to allow God to do the work in us that he desires to do. And that only comes by our willingness to submit to him and to submit so that he can become real and come alive in us. So as Andrew plays, we're going to sing again. And as we sing, I want to invite you this morning to find a place. Maybe it's at your seat. Maybe it's here at the altar. But find a place this morning and say, God, again, I, I want to follow you. I want to submit my way, my will to you. I want to submit to the unity of the house. God, not just what I want, but what you want. I want to surrender all today, God, in an attitude that would say, I trust you. And God, my, 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 my heart and my desire is to see you lifted up more than to see me lifted up. God, I want to have the attitude and the mind of Christ. And so this morning, I want us as a body, it's for you. It's, it's for you to look inside of you and say, this is an area where I need to let go, where I need to let God have control, where I need to submit this to him. And I'm going to ask you as we sing to find a place, you can turn right there at your seat. You can find a place at the altar, but let's submit and say, God, we trust in you. We surrender all to you, just as Bill Borden did in 1905. God, we want to make a decision today that will reverberate from now into eternity. God, that it's not about us, it's about you. It's not about what I want, it's about what you want, that we might have the attitude of Christ. So as we sing, would you find a place to pray, to join me this morning in that? And I surrender all. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Sing that again and let's pray together. I surrender all. Oh, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Oh, God, we do. We surrender to you this morning. How we surrender to you, to your will, to your way. Just as Jesus, just as he would lay down everything, 
just as Peter who would drop everything to follow Jesus, may our hearts and our attitude be the same today, Father. That in this place, in this house, God, that we would not so love our way and not so desire our will, God, but we would submit to you for the good of others. That, God, we would recognize that as we do this, as we place others, we place you above ourselves, that, God, we will see people come to know you. God, we will see those who are lost be found. We will see men and women and and teenagers, God, who have walked away from you, who have been hurt, who have been frustrated, who have been walked away for different reasons, that they will come back, not because of a great word preached, but because of a great life lived, God, a life of surrender that says, God, we trust you. We want your will to be done above all else. So God, move in us today. God, we submit, we surrender to you today, Jesus. We surrender to you today, Jesus. If there are things that, that God has that have just kind of been highlighted in your, in your heart or in your mind, would you just, right where you are, say, God, I, I surrender this to you. If there are things that you can see, attitudes that you know you've held on to, hurts that you've held on to, that, that, that have been there because of whatever offense has been taken, would you right now in this moment say, God, I surrender this to you. God, I give this to you as we begin to do this, as we surrender our will, our way, our hurts, our successes, our pains, our failures. God is able to do immensely more than we could think or imagine. But it starts when we are willing to surrender, to give over to him, to say, God, we trust you. God, move in our hearts and our lives today, Father. We surrender all to you today, Jesus. Not just a little, not just a part, but all to you today, Jesus. You can have it all today, Father. Move in us today, Jesus. Move in us today, Lord. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee. My blessed Savior, I surrender. Sing that one more time with me this morning. And I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I believe that the best days for us are not behind us, but are ahead of us. I believe that God wants to do more in you and through you than you think possible. I think in the, I believe that in in the middle of what you're facing, that God wants you to see him and how he can use you there. But it starts every time with a simple yet difficult act of saying, God, your will not mine. God, your will. And that's not easy. But it's necessary. I'd like to ask you to do one more thing before we leave. This song we sang is I Surrender and there's a universal sign of surrender, isn't there? hands raised saying I give up would you you, if if 
you feel comfortable, would you, in a sign of surrender to the Lord, just lift your hands towards heaven this morning? It's not a sign that we have the answer, but we know the answer. God, our heart today is not simply to see our will fulfilled, but to see your will fulfilled. And that begins with an attitude and a heart of surrender. So today, God, as a body, we, we don't have it all figured out. We, we don't know all the answers. We, we don't know what tomorrow looks like. But God, we know that you are with us and for us. And that God, you will guide us if we'll surrender to you. So give us hearts and attitudes this morning that place your will above ours. Place your desire for us above our plans for us so that we may see your mission fulfilled in and through us. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. I know it'd be very easy just to hear those, to repeat those statements. They sound kind of like cliches. But I say them because I believe it wholeheartedly that God is with you and he's for you. That when we maintain an attitude and a posture of not my will but yours, that we will see God do more than we think possible in and through us. I believe that. I'm convinced of that today. And so, in that attitude, I want to pray blessing over you this week. That God, in His infinite mercy and grace, that not only would he illuminate in you areas that need to be submitted to him, but that he would give you the faith and the courage to believe beyond the doubt and to trust him with it, that as you surrender and submit your will to him, that you will see him work in you in ways you don't even understand possible. May his grace and his mercy go before you. May his word guide you. And may every decision you make be bathed in an attitude of submission to the Father. And that you may see his work completed in you even this week. God's blessing upon each of you as you go. Pray that you have a fantastic week and that we see you here on Wednesday night and back again next Sunday. Not my will, but his. Not my desire, but his. His church, his body, united to accomplish his work in Savannah and beyond. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you.